What's up, marketing maniacs? And welcome back to another episode of From Startup to Wunderbrand, your ultimate BFF in the wide world of digital marketing. Join me, your host, Nicholas Kuhner, spilling the beans on the juiciest trends and hottest tips to up your marketing game. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another exciting, sunny episode here in Oslo of From Startup to Wunderbrand with Nicholas Kuhner. And today we've got the co-founder of Equibrand Brand Consultants, Kristen Kurth. And I'm super excited to speak to another brand person. So how are you doing, Kristen? Well, thank you. The sun is shining here in Northern California, and it looks about the same where you are. Yeah, well, I mean, this is spring and the sun goes down now at about nine o'clock and who knows what time it uh, it comes up in the morning. So we're really enjoying a little bit of sun. As we say, you know, sun's out, bun's out. <laughs> and that is very true here in, in Norway during spring because we've been hibernating for the last couple of months. So, okay, uh, just a bit of background. So you've spent, I won't say how many years in consulting, but quite a few years in consulting with the Fortune 100 brands and startups across just about every industry. You started in advertising, and I see you were at Ogilvy in Chicago as a global management supervisor. So I'm a big fan of Ogilvy and his learnings, so I'm sure you picked up a lot there. And why we're here today is we're going to be talking about a book that you've recently co-authored, which is called Upstream Marketing unlock growth using the combined principles of insight, identity, and innovation, which is also an Amazon bestseller in not just one, but multiple categories. So that's super exciting. So we're going to chat a little bit about this concept of upstream marketing. So maybe just talk to us about how did you come up with the concept of upstream marketing and how is this different to sort of traditional branding or marketing that folks are putting out there that upstream marketing since our our business is pretty much focused on strategy marketing strategy and before i get to that i think one of the best definitions of marketing that i've seen to you know come with fine as i teach marketing at a local university and as i've read so many different explanations of what marketing is in its simplest form Marketing is about meeting customer needs profitably. And so the work that we do and the reason that we've categorized sort of our practice as being driven by insight, identity, and innovation is that the work is focused on really deeply understanding customers. So many of our clients come to us and they, even today, will say, we just, we have trouble in these large organizations being very customer focused. How do we do that? And so we use examples of brands that we've studied over the years and that we've profiled in this book, Apple, Amazon, Google, Starbucks, Southwest Air, companies that we believe are some of the strongest, best sustainable brands, those that will, even in our digital age, be here, not just for the past 20, some, you know, 50 years, but also going forward, they're brands that will be with us for a very long time. What do they do that is different from some brands? And that have been born even in the last 10 to 20 years is that they built their brands upstream, meaning that they were very purposely built around a vision, you know, where they are today, where they see themselves into the future and are using strategic marketing to bridge the gap. And what I mean by what is strategic marketing, I'm talking about how do we position the brand? What do we want to stand for in the minds of our customers today and into the future? What are the tools that we can use in brand development? How do we position? How do we segment large consumer bases? How do we find the right targets, those that are going to be most profitable for growth? How do we continue to innovate so that we're continuing to meet the needs of the customers today and those prospects that we might win tomorrow? So. The whole book is really based on our practice, which is all about marketing strategy. We call that upstream marketing, and we use the fishing analogy. It's everything that happens before, you know, when you're fishing, you have to pick the pond, you have to figure out what lures you're going to use. You have to know, you know, how and when is the right time to go and where you're going to sit. And downstream is really everything that happens once the hook is in the water. 
Um, so downstream marketing are the activation activities of, you know, using digital marketing, how to find customers, where to find them, when to engage with them, how to have a conversation with them that deepens uh, a relationship. Um, the other definitional start I'll leave you with, and this is something from my days at Ogilvy, is the best definition of a brand that I've heard is that a brand is a relationship that a customer or consumer uh, has with a company's products, services, the, the business itself. And so if you think about a brand as a relationship, you start to think about it, you know, as an individual you know, what do we want to be? What do we want to stand for when we show up for these customers? And then downstream, you know, where do we want to, you know, have those conversations? Where do we want to engage with them? And there are many, many channels now. That's the biggest difference. I think downstream marketing has changed much more than upstream from our experience. You know, upstream is stuff that's been done for years, really understanding the customer's needs and building a portfolio sometimes of offerings that can meet those unique needs and finding the segments, you know, where to play, how to win, and how might we create an offering that will continue to meet the needs of our customers or the needs of new customers, you know, into the future. Some really nice definitions there. And uh, because I teach as well, I like having uh, <laughs> tidbits to throw out to the class as well to, to just sort of um, stick in their brains. But when I look at the types of brands that you've picked here, so you've chosen Amazon, Apple, Disney, Google, Nike, etc. These folks, these are now established, quite established brands. And obviously, when they started out, they probably didn't have any idea or a very poor idea of exactly where they're going. So I suppose the, the book is going to be useful for, for folks who are in the growth phase of their marketing versus company startups because the requirements for a startup are completely different than for, for large organizations like this. And the, and the other thing potentially is that these brands all had very strong personalities in terms of the founders. And I, I'm sure in your business, in terms of Equibrand, the importance of founders understanding or having that clarity in terms of insight on the customer, um, creating a strong identity and you know, innovation is what has separated them from the, the other folks in the market. How do you take this process and, and help companies who are perhaps mm -hmm. starting out? Yeah, that's a great question. And something that I have actually spent a lot of time in mo more recently is taking these principles of strategic marketing and applying them to brands that are being started from scratch. And that's where the fun is because the, the process is very similar, whether you've been a high worked on, I worked on, you know, hundred year old brands that are in huge transformations you know, today trying to update their image. But there's some very basic principles about um, any company that I think are relevant, whether you're a startup or a hundred year old brand. And one of those things comes in the form of, you know, uh, your brand purpose. You know, why do we exist is a question that every founder should ask themselves. And I think that within that, is more of the insight about the company itself, the service or products that it's offering. And within purpose, there's some things that I like to do with founders, especially is to ask that question, why do you exist? And then they'll say, well, we exist, let's just say in the wear category, we exist to make the best possible shoe we can build for performance athletes. Okay. So, oh, that's great. Then I'll ask, why is that important? Well, it's important if you're a performance athlete that you take care of your whole body, that you, you know, you've got, you know, stability for your performance, for your knees, whatever it might be. And then you say, well, why is that important? And you start to hear in that conversation with the founder, the real nuggets of insight that say, we don't just exist to make a shoe. You know, like Starbucks didn't just exist to make the best cup of coffee. They might have when they were first started. They were in the coffee business, 
but today they're in a vastly different business. They're in the business of making connections. They're in the business of, you know, they, they actually evolved into a third place. You know, you can have your coffee at home, you can have your coffee at work, but this is the third place where people are congregating to have conversations over coffee, to work over coffee, to study, to do whatever it might be in a Starbucks environment. And they looked at themselves beyond just the product or service. And that's really important for startups to think about not just what they are today and what that product might be, so to speak, but also what other benefits do they offer that layer on top of the actual product itself. So you're not just in the shoe business if you're Nike, you're in the athletic performance business to a greater extent. And beyond that, you're in the business of self-actualization, really at the highest level of that benefit hierarchy based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I thought you start with these attributes. A shoe has a rubber sole, it has different supports, et cetera. And those ladder up to rational benefits that ladder up to higher order benefits. And at the highest order, self-actualization is probably the highest thing. In the automotive industry, we've done a lot of work with large automotive manufacturers, Honda, Acura, Hyundai, We helped Genesis. How do you create an experience that offers the consumer much more than the car that they're driving? It's a statement of who they are. It's uh, um, for some people. For some people, it's a way to get from point A to point B. Do you see there are different customers in that landscape? And we're trying to find the segments in which the offerings of a company can align with those segments. That is true whether you're a startup or a very developed brand. So thinking about your customer landscape, how you might segment the market, and oftentimes this is done hypothetically, you know, a bunch of people in the room, but we do this with very, very um, in-depth surveys of, you know, 200 questions that we write to get at the attitudes within the mind of a consumer as it relates to the car category or the footwear category, whatever category you might be competing in. So you've made a couple of really fun points there. I I love questionnaires and it's amazing what insights you can get from customers who've never really been asked these kind of questions before. So and just take it away from the end consumer, but the actual business, we go through, you know, a whole bunch of brand questions as well. And it's the first time I think, you know, what does my brand sound like, feel like, taste like, you know, these kind of questions. But you brought up an interesting point about self-actualization, and this is where there's no one right way to create or or build a brand, because in some senses, in the past, the self-actualization is, like you said, at the last step of Maslow's hierarchy, where, you know, we want to change the world, be better, etc. But you've actually got to make money and sell products and figure out who your target market is. But I think that's almost flipping on its head now with new brands where they're starting with self-actualization first and then going into, okay, how are we going to make money? How are we going to really get our target markets sorted out in that? The the, the market will come to us. Um, So have you seen any change like that? Is that an experience that you've had or is it more the traditional people have a a widget to sell and they need to sell it to as many people as possible? So I was talking self-actualization in the past was the final step of uh, when a brand had made enough money, been around long enough, it could do some self-actualization. Nowadays, I think there's almost a switch in terms of brands or businesses are starting out wanting to get to that self-actualization phase first before actually thinking about all of the other elements that are important in the marketing and and uh, so the marketing strategy and the brand strategy side have you felt yeah. that or found that in in your business or is this just uh, uh, something i'm making up not at all the thing that i think i hear the most and it scares me the most and it also makes me wonder whether or not that's a great you know client for us to be honest is when they say we want to be a lifestyle brand And they have one product (laughs) and it might be, you know, some sort of, you know, let's say cream or facial, you know, cosmetic or whatever it might be. And, you know, they aspire to be 
at a place where some of these very advanced brands are. My next question to them would be, well, how much do you have? How much budget do you have? What is, you know, what is, well, we don't have any money, but that's what we want to be. And, you know, the reality is these brands have invested (laughs) billions in becoming, you know, lifestyle brands. So what we like to do is at the beginning is really start with the discipline of understanding and, you know, really deeply analyzing the customer, you know, understanding the customer landscape, understanding that there are very different attitudes within a customer set. And when you're just starting to sell, you've got data on, you know, who bought and you might say, well, these are the segments we're seeing who are buying but you're defining those segments oftentimes, you know, demographically, geographically, which just isn't enough. The richest segmentation work that can be done is, is when you look at the, the minds, the thinking, the attitudes of various customers, because, you know, I might be somebody who is a weekend warrior and runs occasionally or walks or whatever it is. I'm still within that consumption market of a brand like Nike or Adidas or whatever it might be. But um, how I view the category of footwear might be the same as some 80 year old man who runs, you know, 10 marathons a year still. So when you define, if you see like somebody who is a performance athlete at 23 might have similar attitudes to a performance athlete in his later years. And those might be worth a segment to go after because they're always going to be buying new shoes, the latest, the greatest technology. They're both vested in the brand for the same reason. We want to find those clusters of customers who group together based on their attitudes. And that's more of a looking through the windshield versus the rear view mirror in a way. You know, our data tells us what happened in the past. You know, our vision shows us what's going to happen in the future and finding and having those insights about what the customer landscape really looks like is so important. And it's proprietary knowledge that can be the difference between winning and losing to, you know, to if you've seen brands that like, you know, their automotive brands, the funky car from Honda that was boxy and, you know, they wanted to position it for younger consumers who thought that was really cool. Well, they missed the mark because older people were buying this car and it was for different, you know, different functionality, a different reason. And if they had looked at the business through the eyes of their customer, and I, when I talk about, you know, the customer, I'm talking about the center of the bullseye. That's another question a founder should ask is, who are we building this brand for? You know, what is the way that that particular target thinks? The example we use a lot is Nike and Gatorade. You know, if you really look at who they build those brands for, those are for really elite athletes. Nike tests everything with performance athletes. The center of their bullseye is to meet the needs of the customer who sets the highest hurdle. So a performance athlete would be the center of their bullseye. But where will the sales come from? They'll come from everywhere. But this is kind of um, something that people struggle with. Well, if you're only targeting a very small number, you know, if you're looking at such a small group, how are you going to win in the greater marketplace? Do you win because you're building an aspirational brand for a type of customer who really does live the lifestyle of a performance athlete? And other people will want to come to that party. You're going to get your consumption market from a much broader base of customers, but you have to be very focused when you go out and understand and commit to who that center of the bullseye is. That's just one example of, you know, marketing strategy and how we can learn from the biggest and best brands because that's how they started. They started, you know, developing a shoe. On a, you know, I love the story of Nike that he, um, you know, Phil Knight hired somebody for like 60 bucks to develop the Nike swoosh and look at what, you know, that little investment has brought to the, to the entire category um, and to popular culture. You know, think about the impact that that little swoosh had, but yeah. it's because, you know, they really knew who their customers were and who they were building their original products for. 
you get into an interesting point about the $60 logo because that obviously annoyed a lot of people. Ah, oh, this this logo or this brand is worth so much money. How could they they owe that designer tons and tons of money? But what I always sort of tell folks is that they could have used a banana. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's, as you said, a brand is a relationship and it's built over time. And the company has spent money on multiple fronts, billions of dollars, you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars marketing and building that logo. It could have been anything. And that's when people get too fixated on the logo and the colors, etc. They sort of miss the fact that brands like these typically take 10 years to to really build a bit of track record. And this ties into your point about data. The reason companies that can last over that five, 10 year mark is that they've got data on the customers, what they buy, what they don't buy, mistakes that they've made. And a lot of this is data driven. And now that we're in this very big data driven economy, companies who are able to, who have lots of legacy data or lots of data are going to be the ones at the at the top of the tree. But it does open up the opportunity for smaller companies to access all of this amazing data that's out there and sort of leapfrog these traditional brands. But I feel that we are necessarily going to get these enormous brands like Nike, Coca-Cola, Disney, etc., popping up out of nowhere that much in the future because the market has only enough space for a certain number of sort of royalty brands we just going to be seeing smaller brands to look after one segment of the population and then sort of disappear after when that target market moves on because what i found through my experience now is that in the past we could use living standard measures and we did a lot of work with unilever and we could understand customers really well but customers and customer mindsets, the psychographics and demographics, et cetera, are changing so quickly now that all of this data is out of date the minute it's in print, basically. So how this comes perhaps into your innovation, yes. well, it touches both onto your in insight and innovation side. I mean, constant innovation, how much is too much, how much is too little? Maybe talk to us about the, the create, test and learn strategy process that Thanks. you've written about. Again, and perfect for the land of startups where, I mean, the internet has democratized the ability to access customers. And that's exactly, you know, your point is so well taken because you can be a you know, tiny maker of whatever it is and present yourself in a way that you look like a Fortune 500 brand. So it's, you know, I think about the relationship, you know, let's say you're meeting new people, you're going to go for the first time and you're going to launch this brand and how it shows up. Again, startups can, if they are managed properly, find a really great designer who came from an Ogilvy or another land or whatever big identity firm and make their appearance look like it's a great brand. And we've seen a lot of examples of this. Um, I'll use this one. I taught this case in a recent business school class about the Casper mattress brand. That was an amazing introduction to, you know, a mattress in a box. They figured out a way to so uniquely change the way that people viewed the bed in which they sleep. They made it possible to not spend, you know, $10,000 on a mattress. And they found a way to package it in a way that was so unique and so different and very exciting. And by the way, it wasn't breaking the bank at, at its, you know, early stages. So you could buy one. You were okay if you made a mistake. If you were an early adopter and it didn't work out, it wasn't like you were losing, you know, a huge investment. And they presented like a big brand. They started getting a following. They got great investors. But from this case that I was recently teaching, they've never been profitable. So, you know, what happened? And people ask the question. I don't know the exact answers, but I would venture to guess that they got a lot of investment. They built a team very quickly. They kept, you know, in order to scale that original startup, it took a lot of money to operationally get this brand out into the marketplace. Well, what was happening 
while that was taking a lot of that early and you know in, investment was being used to set up this company and hire a bunch of people, et cetera. You know, uh, the relevance was there. You know, the rele there was high relevance, but differentiation became very difficult. You know, people were starting to see, well, these cost about the same. You know, this one's a little less. Oh, but this one has 25,000 reviews and they're all, you know, four and a half to five stars. Okay, another way that the consumer has taken charge of how brands are viewed. Another major data point, you know, that that is being used now to say, well, gosh, as a consumer, I have access to all this information. You know, do I have to buy a Casper now? I mean, that's just, they're spending a lot of money building the Casper brand, but this seems to be just as good. It's a lot less expensive. Do I really care? Nobody's going to see that. <laughs> mattress I sleep on, you know, and I think that that's something, you know, that challenge and having all of these brands popping up that may be here today, they may be gone tomorrow, um, to continually invest, to develop relationships that are that loyal among the users of a brand, it's very difficult to do for a continued period of time. And I know Casper then went into some brick and mortar stores, they're doing a lot of things to try to stay ahead of all of these copycats in a way, but are they going to be successful? Are they going to be wildly profitable? Are they going to be what they were originally thought of when investors started coming in? I don't know. I think there's a lot of competition now, and that's where you have to continue. Innovation is about continuing to adjust your relevance and differentiation, which is what positioning is. You know, the goal of positioning is to be as relevant as you possibly can and as different. I'm doing that little graph chart. And you want to be out here where you're, you know, <laughs> highly relevant, highly different. And that's the constant battle for brands. Are we still relevant? And that's where a lot of this data comes in. Are we relevant? Well, you've got to ask different questions when you're looking at relevance than you would, you know, just tracking your sales and you're doing well, you need to unvolve that. That's why I love qualitative. What are the, you know, the whys? Why are well in a certain market? You know, what's going on there changing? How are consumers becoming more accepting of these, you know, I, I call the land of brands that are hard to pr pr pronounce. You know, they're like these wacky names of all of these <laughs> different products. But, you know, I just bought a little sun shirt from some no-name brand on Amazon, super high ratings. It was fairly inexpensive, but you know, yeah, Nike, I could have gone to another manufacturer, brand name manufacturer, but I bought this shirt to wear underneath another. Do I really care? And that's where people start to ask the question, do brands matter? Do brands matter? Yes, they matter. It depends on the category. It depends on the time. It depends on the culture at the time. And it really, you know, depends on whether or not a company has the best relationships they can possibly have with their customers. And that requires insight. It requires an identity that says, yes, I want to be associated with that. And it requires constant innovation. So creating, testing, and learning is about offering different products or services that can go along with that original offering, finding ways to stay relevant and different. And that is the constant challenge, I think, for any brand launching today. I'm going to have an entire episode on exactly what you mentioned there. Do brands matter? And, you know, I've been in the brand space for years and years. And more and more, my mindset is it, it, de it depends. <laughs> And that's a tough thing to say, especially as a brand person, because, you know, we've been brought up you know, brands that make the world go around. But like you said, that sunshine, you probably don't remember who, what the company was or the brand is, and you'll probably never buy it again. It was just good price, fitted what you're looking for that day, and it has no meaning. There are no other touch points that you're going to engage with that ever again. And, you know, if we want to look at a summary of what a brand is, a, a brand is a promise basically of some sort of delivery or a, a certain type of performance and when you go into banks and cars and things like that i think brands become important and it's another way of just differentiating yourself in a cluttered market so you know if you go into 
I, I'm a, when I grew up in South Africa, our stores had very few different types of products. We had Coca-Cola, we had Fanta, we had Sprite, we had perhaps one or two homemade uh, local products, and that was it. Those are your choices. The same in breakfast cereals. There's just Kellogg's, and then later on there was another one. But we didn't have terribly much choice. Um, and now that there's much more choice, we're still defaulting to the brands that we know because we know exactly what to expect. And we also have some recourse if there's something wrong with the product. And I think that's where brands are important. You've got some recourse if something goes wrong or doesn't deliver on what it promises. And especially in emerging markets, that promise that it's going to deliver what it says is super important. So yeah, that brand question is a, is a very fun one. And you could probably talk about that for a long time. Oh, I always love, I love that. Well, think about the price premium. You know, for companies, they're very important because companies have, you know, really one purpose, and that is to solve a problem for a consumer. You know, delivering a product or service that meets the needs of a customer profitably. So meeting those needs, customers are the core of everything that a company does. And building those relationships, you know, gives you the ability to charge more. It gives you the forgiveness. I mean, if if a company I've been associated with for years and years makes a mistake, I'm more forgiving because I have a relationship with that business or brand. But in an event where I remember I was booking flights years ago on Travelocity, I don't even know, I'm, I think they're still in business, but I had a terrible terrible experience with Travelocity and a customer service call around 9-11 when I was canceling a flight. And the person on the other end of the phone said something very shocking to me. You know, and I, because I'm so involved with brands and I care a lot about how customers are treated, I went to the CEO of the company and repeated, I said, please go back and listen to the, the phone calls from this period of time and listen to the answer that I was given by one of your customer service people. And next morning I woke up and there was a letter from about five people from the company, you know, talking about how they were appalled by how this person had handled the situation of canceling a flight, you know, days after 9-11. And it was, um, you know, one of those things that I never thought, I was like, I'm not going to use that. I don't need Travelocity because there's Orbitz, there's Kayak, there's this, there's that. There are all these other, you know, competitors out there who do the same thing. You know, I wanted to like that brand and it was newer. I was willing to try, but then, you know, they made a mistake and I was like, I'm done. But if a brand that I'm very engaged with, you know, I, I ran the Wilson Sporting Goods business at Ogilvy, you know, globally. And I did even before that because I grew up playing sports. I you know, golf, tennis, team sports, all of those. There was something really wonderful about that brand. I think it's lost its edge. I know why, you know, they haven't invested and nurtured that brand to the degree that they could have. And it wasn't performing, especially as well in certain categories in which they competed. But there wasn't a level of nurturing and investment that was required to continue those deep relationships. But if Wilson makes a mistake, you know, oh gosh, I'm not going to not, you know, use another Wilson product. I'll still buy Wilson racket. I'll buy, you know, whatever it might be. I buy golf balls, whatever, but I'm not going to cast them aside because of the brand. And that's where I think you stated it earlier was the idea that there is, you know, it takes the risk out of a decision for a consumer. So lots of good things. Absolutely. And I, and I love that point. I mean, that point about the business has an opportunity to rectify any problems. And when you see how smart companies use um, sites, Google Business, or any of these sites that have recommendations, where there's negative or positive, that they respond and they deal with it immediately. You, Like you said, you are very willing to give them a second chance if they give you some attention. So, yeah, I mean, th there's so many facets to building a great brand. And I'm sure this book of yours, in terms of upstream marketing, obviously, I've been <laughs> focusing a little bit on brand here, but on the marketing strategy side, all of these tie into it, and it can tie into the value proposition of the business as well. How do you deal with customers? How do you deal with suppliers? And these are things as your business matures, you really need to start thinking about. And I'm sure 
this book in terms of your seven-step approach and the various marketing applications would be a, a fascinating tool for folks who want to improve their current business or if they're going to start up a business, just start reading these concepts because as your business, you might find, ooh, I didn't know that. But if you've read this book, you'll know, ah, these are things that I need to consider as the business progresses. So, Kristen, thank you so much for your time. Some awesome uh, discussions here. Where can folks get this book and how can folks get in touch with you if they would like to supercharge oh, yeah. their upstream marketing? So upstreammarketing.com is a, it's its own site, but this is the book and you can buy it on Amazon. And it also comes in an um, uh, video, or I'm sorry, uh, an audio book. So if you want to just listen to it, you can listen to it. It's in paperback and, and um, hardcover on Amazon. And there are a lot of tools in there that I think are important for younger companies or I've been starting to focus on small to mid-sized businesses because I think that's where we can have a great impact. And that's really why we wrote the book was that we've had all this experience with these huge brands that are really struggling with some of the same things that, you know, small startups will struggle with at some point, if not at the beginning. Start laying the foundation with an upstream marketing strategy, which is really the steps are right here in the book. Then what we like to say is in creating testing and learning, I think what a lot of brands try to do is let's try, um, oh, let's go after SEO. Let's try to get on the first page. Let's try email marketing. Let's try. That's creating and testing and learning. You've got to do that downstream, but don't spend a penny is our advice to those young brands until you build your upstream marketing strategy. Because if you do this, you will be focused on the right customers. A value proposition is how do your benefits align directly with the needs of customers, the customers that you are trying to bring into your brand. And those are the ones that you're trying to grow your business with. How do those benefits align? And then how do you operationalize those? And that gets into some of the downstream tactics that you can use and test, always testing to see, first of all, I think one of the first outgrowths of this upstream marketing is building a messaging framework. A lot of companies just are out there saying all of these different things, hoping that something will strike a chord with someone. And there are brands that get really lucky. You know, I love the, the brand um, Stanley, the Stanley Cup and their story is fascinating that they, you know, grew 10X by virtue of, a you know, one of the things that happened was a viral video of a Stanley Cup in a car that had, had caught fire. And the car was completely demolished and the Stanley Cup was still in the cup holder as sturdy as can be with cold beverage inside. Something viral. That was a piece of luck. <laughs> what if you as a brand knew that durability was one of the needs of the customer and you made sure that your product exceeded all durability for any comparable brands in the category that you had a claim there? Put those two things together at the beginning and then you're creating content that actually brings to life a story about that brand that is meaningful, a story that ties to your value proposition, a story that can engage consumers at many different levels at many different times. That to me is strategic marketing, where you're actually intentionally creating content that tells your story in a meaningful way so that you're deepening those customer relationships. And that's one of the things I think that every brand should have. You know, we talk about value propositions using different definitions, but, you know, the way that we think about it is just aligning the benefits that you uniquely offer the world with those specific needs that your customers have, and then operationalizing all of that, whether it's in you know, back end operations, whether it's in fulfillment, whether, you know, it, whatever aspect of the business needs to be focused on that alignment, you do that and you do it with intention rather than just throwing a bunch of things, you know, out there and hoping that something is embraced. 
that's just complete and utter madness. And that's sometimes the inefficiency of a startup is doing a lot of different things, not really knowing what you're trying to do. You're just out there. You're trying to find people as opposed to planning up front. It doesn't take a long time. We do some of these projects in you know, two to three months, really with big, big brands to do the necessary research, to give you deep customer understanding and insight, developing the identity, which is the value proposition, the target, the positioning, all of that brand architecture. That's a whole other podcast because a lot of companies have these proliferated product names and they need to be scaled back to make sense to a customer that you are really trying to hone in on. So um, there's a lot in this that can be done to make companies more efficient and help startups know that you don't have to hire the most expensive, big, experienced agency out there, but you can spend little bits of money finding great designers or great digital marketing partners who can get you to where you need to show the results that you need, the profitability really that you need before you start to scale. And, you know, hoping that we can um, make that process a little bit more um, intentional so that brands don't, you know, that these early brands don't, you know, fall down before they've had a chance to share their story with the world. So that was one of the reasons that we that we actually wrote the book. Well, if I really look at the structure of the book, you know, having worked through all of these processes myself, I think that if anyone is going to go into marketing, looking at strategic marketing, so say they haven't necessarily done a degree or educated themselves in that way, this book is going to be a fantastic primer in terms of what to do, because marketing isn't brain surgery. There is a process to it, and it's a very repeatable process. And I think if they take this process, insight, identity, innovation, and then actually execute it, they've done the basics right. And I think this book covers all of that. And yeah, so if you are struggling in your business, you coming from a industry that's coming from a, a career that isn't in marketing, and you really want to know the ins and outs of marketing from uh, using some of Kristen's experience, I can tell you that the structure of this book is perfect. It will give you what you need and hopefully it doesn't put you out of business, Kristen, because it uh, covers quite a lot. <laughs> right. Plenty of work out there, plenty of work and plenty of company, like different stages too. You know, it's a book about growth, how to grow. Yeah. Obviously, early growth is different from late stage or later stage. Great. But again, I love that you say there is a process and it, it's very repeatable. So we're hoping that people get what they yeah. need just to set them off on the right path from the start. Absolutely. Kristen, thank you so much for your time. I will oh, stick the details right. of where folks can get the book and where they can get in touch with you and your business if they want to rocket their growth. And thank you so much for your time. And I hope you have a yeah. marvelous weekend. All right. You as well. Thanks, Nicholas. Take care. Now, before we wrap up, don't forget to show some love for From Startup to Wunderbrand by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to help us grow, tell your friends, share on social media and leave us a review. For those of you who want to dive a little bit deeper into the topic, join me on Twitter at Nick Kuna. Let's connect and chat about all things branding and digital. Until next time, 